Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Saki, and we are at the Transformative Technology Conference. It's so fun here, so many diverse leaders. We are now sitting down with Dr. Daniel Stickler. Hello. Nice to be here. Thank you for coming on to the show. Greatly appreciate it. And so as we talk about Apiron, which you're co-founder of and um, the medical director for Neurohacker, collective. So there's a lot to talk about regarding the the disruption of well-being into our ecosystems. And so we'll get there. We'll talk about that. I want to ask you how you became who you are today. Okay. Like what led you up to you <laughs> now? Okay, I'll try to keep it as short as possible because it is a long story. Mm -hmm. um, I always wanted to be a doctor. Uh, I always looked at Physicians, though, from the perspective of the role is to really enhance health. I got into medical school and I realized the role was to move away from disease. And it wasn't about enhancing health, you know, moving towards something really awesome versus moving away from something really bad. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it became about pharmacology and disease. And when I was in medical school, I looked at the different options for what I could do to still at least kind of fit into my perception of what I should be doing. And I found surgery. So hmm. I became a general vascular surgeon. Uh, it gave me the ability to take somebody with a certain quality of life and I could either bring them at least back to baseline or, or I did some weight loss surgery. So I was able to work with people who had fairly low quality of life and I was able to elevate them to, to a new level. Mm -hmm. and for a time that seemed to be satisfying that that need that I had to to fill that role but over time I also realized it wasn't the right way to do it and it wasn't accomplishing what I was wanting to do started getting into wellness as kind of a hobby uh, started doing health optimization uh, with with clients in a concierge style practice as a little side job that I uh, truly it was a hobby it wasn't making any money it was just something I enjoyed doing and uh, eventually I just said, one day I said, I'm done. I'm not gonna do surgery anymore. I walked out of the operating room and canceled all the rest of my surgeries. I had an 800 person waiting list for weight loss surgery. Um, wow. People thought I lost my mind. And I was like, no, nope, I'm gonna do this full time. Um, wow. Yeah, and I started getting into genetics, uh, kind of self-taught in the genetic and the epigenetic realm mm -hmm. and um, developed a very biospecific uh, personalized approach to healthcare. And dang, just that moment, I'm, I'm happy you knew from, a ch from childhood that you wanted to, to, do, to be a doctor because um, sometimes it's, uh, well, first of all, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, societal pressure to, <laughs> you know, to, to figure out what one wants to do. And so many people are like, oh, what are you gonna do when you're older and stuff? Anyway, we go down that rabbit hole. But I, I, like, I like how you knew what you wanted to do. You figured it out quickly and then you went and did it. And as you were doing it, you figured out that you wanted to transition into a very similar f field of health and wellness, but you wanted to do it at a point of, of, uh, of making people better um, of, 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 uh, at, rather than having the disease and then being better. You wanted to pre <laughs> prevent a disease from even occurring in the first place. Yeah. Seems to be a common trend here, which I really like. Now. You know, what, for, for you, for that, you know, for that transition for you to, um, to uh, appear on, is the, and that was, that's where appear on, that is what appear on is. That was the birth is. of appear on, right. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And then, so tell us about that. You're studying genomics, epigenetics, uh, and genetics, and then you're, um, and you're figuring out kind of the um, an, uh, strong practices for maintaining good health. Is that right? Well, what I, what happened, it was this kind of this epiphany that I realized that, um, and it was funny because I was reading uh, Ishmael by Daniel Quinn at the time, and it hit me. And I was like, this is what's wrong. The medical system is broken to the point where it's not something that we can shift. It's broken to the point where we have to just walk away and create something different. Yeah. The reason is, is because the current medical system and healthcare and wellness even in general, it's based on the premise that the human system is a complicated system. And that's why we have algorithms and things like that. You know, your cholesterol is this and you have this blood pressure, you know, these are the medications, algorithm based. 
Um, problem is the human system is not complicated. It's complex, and you can't apply complicated intelligence to a complex system. It doesn't work. The complex system is just highly variable. I mean, truly, the medical system looks at the human system as a robot that has a completely reductionistic approach. It has um, predictable outcomes for everything, and yet we know there is no predictability, and it is just everything interacts in the human system. I mean, DNA, DNA, the molecule, is the most intelligently designed molecule I've ever seen. I mean, the more I learn about it, the more I'm just fascinated by DNA. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about a molecule that is the core of everything we know of life. Mm -hmm. And it is constantly assessing our environment and making changes in its expression to thrive in that environment. Yeah. Constant adaptation to the environment. And it contains memories. It holds memories of your ancestors in that genetic code. And then we're seeing this now in epigenetics and transgenerational epigenetics, yeah. where we're seeing the ability to analyze this code and see how it's being passed. And it's just fascinating stuff. I love how you poeted that. That was beautifully said. It's not only the molecule of life, but it's also the takes on the epigenetics of the environment, learns how to thrive in that environment. So, so now, um, yeah, where does a Puron come into? to play then with this so knowledge? So we developed the, our medical program, which we've been doing since uh, really 2012 uh, in this model. And I was giving presentations uh, at medical conferences and physicians kept asking me if I could teach them how to do what I was doing. Never thought about it and I thought, well, yeah, I guess I could. So we started developing some training modules and mm. working with some clinicians one-on-one -on -one. Uh, that eventually, in 2015, led to us opening the Apparent Academy, which is a training uh, ground for basically any, anybody. Mm. So anybody interested in health. And we, have, we currently have 160 coaches in the, um, in the training or have completed it. And they 30% are physicians, 30% chiropractors, and the other 40%, you name it, um, dietitians, psychologists, pharmacists, uh, nurses, health coaches, uh, general biohackers that yeah. just want to get into this. Uh, so it's a new paradigm. It's not a changing of the old paradigm. And you know, the Greeks had it right from the get-go. The Greeks knew epigenetics. They knew complex systems. And we messed it up. Um, you look back at even the term dietetica. Dietetica was about man's whole way of living. Mm -hmm. The true definition of it. And it talked about the way he slept. Uh, the way he worked, the interaction with his family, and the food he ate, and how much he ate. Yeah. I mean, that was the initial yeah. grounds of Hippocratic medicine. Yeah. And those variables are what makes a life thrive or can just make a life really miserable. Right. Um, Everything goes into that system, and the system responds to it. Yep. And that's what we've missed. We have stovepiped everything. I mean, oh, you look at what will kill, top 10 killers kill 75% of Americans are, you know, heart disease and cancer, one and two. Mm -hmm. But if you look at all of those top 10 common causes of death, every single one of them is lifestyle related. And yet, how do we address them? Well, type two diabetes, well, we change their diet, we give them medication. It's the whole lifestyle, though, that mm -hmm. created the problem in the first place. The same with heart disease, the same with, um, with asthma, the same with accidents. You know, we don't even think about accidents being lifestyle related, but the most common cause of accidents is sleep deprivation. And sleep is probably the most common lifestyle intervention that we work with in clients. Mm -hmm. Wow, sleep is the most common oh, lifestyle yeah. change. Interesting that people are just not sleeping eight hours a night. <laughs> I don't think any, I mean, it's like a 2% of the population actually get the full complement of sleep in a night. You gotta, there's no other way to do it. I mean, and, and yeah, yeah. The interesting thing is the sleep genes are some of the oldest genes in all of life. Yeah, yeah. We share sleep genes with insects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how prolific the sleep genes are. And 
we haven't selected out short sleep. You know, you would think short sleep would be a survival benefit. You know, the caveman that sheeps, sleeps less time is less vulnerable to predation or anything like that. Uh -huh. So those that slept less would probably be selected out to be the ones that passed on the genes. Didn't happen. Maybe even if you stayed in the safe cave and you slept longer, that you would have less time out in the environment. Therefore, <laughs> that's less a possibility <laughs> too. But you would think that you know there would be a benefit to sleeping less. That's what most people perceive. Mm -hmm. But from a development and ancestral genetic standpoint, we don't see that. So there must be something really important about getting that sleep. Totally. Interesting that that's like one of the f first variables that needs to be tweaked for, for people. Yeah. Now, so now what does it look like to, uh, you know, you're traveling, you're, all these physicians were really interested in getting onboarded, um, and you have a lot of people that are not just physicians, like you were listing all the other people that are, um, that go through your program. So, <clears throat> so what, what happens when they sign up for the program? What do they learn and what do they go and teach then other people? So we do 100 hours of online training, uh, training genetics and epigenetics. Mm -hmm. So the epigenetics are broken into the modules of the different lifestyle components. Um, we teach them how to alter gene expressions through lifestyle components. We teach them what certain lifestyle components can do to change gene expressions, mm -hmm. like lack of sleep mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about 100 hours of online training. We have a pretty active um, private Facebook group where we all interact. It's mm -hmm. pretty cool because you have people from every specialty. I mean, traditional Chinese medicine and allopathic doctors having discussions about a particular case that they're working on or a client that they have. And everybody's contributing equally. Judgment-free zone. I mean, it's amazing the tribe that's been created with that group. Yeah, I want to be in that Facebook group to <laughs> learn from everyone in there. I'm going to request to, to join that group. Um, is there a, you know, it would, like walk us through a, someone that becomes a, a one that takes on a Piron's, uh processes. So I go through 100 hours of training. I learn about um, genetics and epigenetics. I learn about them in all of the different um, variations of the lifestyles, uh, changes in variables that we were talking about. And then, then I go and I apply what I learn to, as a life coach or a physician, to right. our populations of people that they're working Right, with. because we, we see that as the next, kind of the next need. You know, everybody talks about this physician shortage. We don't have a healthcare crisis. We have a lifestyle crisis. We need lifestyle coaches. Mm -hmm. We don't need more physicians, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. uh, we need people that can spend that time. I mean, when I work with a client, I'm on a video call for 30 to 40 minutes once a month. Mm -hmm. Every month, for mm -hmm. 12 months, I'm interacting with them as part of our interaction. So they're getting six hours a year, a year minimum of FaceTime with me. Yeah, And we work with every aspect of their health. So every call I'm talking about what's working with this, what's not working with this, what's the next step, what does your biometric device tell me about your sleep? Uh, you know, when your yeah. doctor's creeping on your sleep, you're a little bit like, ooh, okay. Maybe I, I need to get those eight hours. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we treat, te teach the coaches the same thing. So the coaches can work with it, and, and we're not talking about a financial model that's out of range for everybody, because we have a wide girth of coaches that all have trained under the same platform. They may not have the same credentials, but they're also not gonna charge the same fees for this. And this can be a model that a physician group can adopt and actually utilize in that regard. But with this, we teach them to bio-individualize the approach. So there's nothing cookie cutter about what we do. Mm -hmm. Everything is about how is this person a unique individual? We look at their genetics. Uh, we have our own genetic tests that we do. Um, similar to the 23andMe, but it's a very private and you own your own data. We don't share, we don't sell, nothing like that. We have genetic reports that we work with. We train the coaches and the clinicians on how to interpret those reports. So you actually have somebody that can interpret your genetics for you. And then with those genetics, they can be very individualized and biospecific about, you know, this is a, a nutritional pattern that has the highest probability of working well for you. This is an exercise pattern based on your goals that will most likely get you there. 
but it's not a matter of absolutes. We're not gonna say, oh, this is the perfect diet. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. We look at it and we say, okay, is this diet conducive to your genetics? Is it conducive towards your goals? And is it conducive towards what your desires are as far as food? And if that works, then we try it. And we set metrics up. So if we can measure it, we can manage it. Everything we do, we measure it. Like when, when a client comes in and they say, oh, I'm on these 20 supplements, I'm like, okay, I need to know why you're taking each one and what you're doing to measure the, whether it's working or not. Yeah. And I can tell you if they can't answer both of those, they get marked off the list. Mm -hmm. We take them off, mm -hmm. okay, until the end when I say, okay, here are the supplements I would recommend. This is why we're gonna take them and this is what we're gonna measure, measure to see if they work. Yeah, yeah. Man, these, these practices, I'm happy that you've put them into, um, into a, a curriculum for for people to be able to access and apply to their lives, just because it's ridiculous if we're if we're not uh, if we don't know the why of why of why we're doing things and we're not measuring. Um, just and like you said, we need more lifestyle coaches, not physicians. Just right. people that can help us understand how we can tweak things in our environment that will help us live healthier, more emotionally well-being Absolutely. lives. Yeah. So, okay, so how many total people have went through a Piron now? Do you know? As far as coaches? As far as co yeah, coaches. Um, completed the training, we've had about uh, 60. 60, Yeah, cool. we've got another 100 in the training right now. Nice. Mm -hmm. And it takes them how long to 100 hours? Is it varies. It varies, uh, yeah. So they get full access to the course when they register, but uh, some of them will burn through it in three to four months, and some of them will take over a year. A year, yeah, cool, mm -hmm. okay. And then, um, and then what, so what does it, what, so how big is the team then, your team? Our team, we have about uh, 16 people in the corporate level. 16 yeah. people, okay. And then it, the cost of the course is? It's around $3,000. $3,000, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and has it been spreading mostly like word of mouth related? It has. Uh, I, I speak quite a bit, you speak uh, good, yeah, so yeah. Uh, a lot of people will hear me when I when I give talks. Um, we also travel around and do two day live seminars to give people a kind of a taste. Oh, sweet! Of that. So. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Where, when when was the last one? So we were in Austin in September. Uh, December we're in Sarasota. Uh, sure. Then we are touring Australia Whoa. and New Zealand. So nice. March is Australia, New Zealand. And then I think we're coming back to Chicago before June. So. Two day workshops, and at these workshops, they're learning uh, what you're teaching. We teach them basic genetics and epigenetics because yeah. it's something that a lot of the healthcare practitioners are they kind of dabble in, but they're not really sure of the yeah. science of yeah, it. Yeah. Um, you know, epigenetics. So epigenetics is one of these things that uh, you know Bruce Lipton was great. He brought it to the forefront, mm -hmm. um, but I think he took it a little bit too far into the you know, the pseudoscience world, uh, trying to explain things with it. Um, and a lot of people have adopted it in pseudoscience to explain the unexplainable, mm. which, you know, epigenetics has true science behind it. I mean, totally. there's over 10,000 peer reviewed journal articles published a year. There's over 200 clinical trials actively going. Um, and believe it or not, it's physicians that are the most skeptical about epigenetics, uh, and yet we have tons of literature on it. Yeah. yeah so. I think w once we get to a point where we understand uh, epigenetics really well, I think we can manifest our destinies better. Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, you know, people will say, you know, oh, I've got the, these genes in my family. I'm like, so what? Mm. You know, the genes are nothing more than the code of propensity. Mm -hmm. The lifestyle is your destiny. Mm -hmm. That's what you have control over. And, you know, even people with like the APOE4, Alzheimer's risk gene, you know, you can, based on your lifestyle, you can have 30 times standard risk. But you can also do lifestyle practices, which we've shown in research, that's been able to bring that risk almost down to average. Yeah. Even with a high risk for developing it. Yeah. So we know these lifestyle factors have huge impacts on gene expression. Damn. Mm -hmm. I was born with this gene. So what? Yeah. So, so what? You can, we can make change. We can make change with the way that we behave in our environments. Wow. Um, now, is there something, now do you foresee a future where more people are uh, 
uh, aware of the epigenetic science and that can like manifest their destiny through behavior changes and do they themselves take like a smaller version of your course to make those changes or do they always work with like a, someone that has taken your full course or how would how do you see that playing out um well that that kind of brings up something we have transitions of health progression so we have the unbalanced state which is what the hippocratic medicine did not recognize disease as a entity they said system was either in homeostasis or it was unbalanced out of homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Most people are out of homeostasis. So the first step is to get them into homeostasis. Mm -hmm. Once we're there, then coach, physician, whoever can take them and say, okay, what are your goals? Okay, these, this is how we can leverage lifestyle components to change gene expressions to optimize your functioning as a human being. Mm we see another phase of this though and this is the enhanced human phase and I mean even even Stephen Hawking's in his final book uh, said gene editing is coming and we are going to see the enhanced human beings and you either accept it or you become a slave to those <laughs> and um, you know that's something that uh, a lot of people are uncomfortable with yeah. but for me to think that homo sapien is the end point of evolution yeah. is a bit naive. Totally. And we are the first species to ever take the reins of evolution into our own hands. And we should get good at it and yeah. practice it. Yeah, and have stewardship for Earth and yeah, practice and, it, yeah. You know, it, it, it amazes me that, you know, they did a study asking people if they were okay with gene editing. And it was like, okay, we're okay if a child's gonna be born with a life-threatening disease or mm -hmm. a birth defect mm -hmm. or something like that, we're okay with gene editing. Mm -hmm. But we're not okay with gene editing to make people smarter, stronger, faster. But that's so, yeah, but that's what we do every day is we try and make ourselves smarter and stronger. We do, and, yeah. and you know, I say, what is one thing that can potentially have such a profound impact on society? Smart people. Yes. You know, we become more intelligent, we become more empathet empathetic, we become more compassionate. We are able to create solutions to a lot of the problems that we've created already. So what is wrong with creating a smarter human being? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder if, still I'm curious, if it's gonna end up being something that, you know, if, if I can access a Puron in a smaller, dose to be to, to have a like a, that small dose of here's a behavior change I can do that can immediately start affecting me positively without having to learn everything to and not everything but a lot and then um, well and see yeah. this comes down to the complex nature of the human being mm. um, every piece of the environment interacts it's just like you know height height from a genetic standpoint we used to think that there we could identify a gene for height then we said, okay, well, it's polygenic. It means there's 10, 20 genes that, that are involved in determining height. Well, then they found out that, yeah, the key 20 genes account for about 1% of height differences. Um, the new model is um, that the entire genome contributes to every trait that we have. Mm. And it's the same with lifestyle. Mm. Everything within lifestyle contributes to outcome. So when we work with somebody, somebody may come in and they say, well, you know, I have diabetes and, and this, that, and the other thing. And I'm like, I don't care. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna work on your sleep. We're gonna work on your stress. We're gonna work on your nutrition. We're gonna work on your supplementation. We're gonna work on your hormones. We're gonna work on your movement and exercise. And we're gonna work on mitigating your environment. Yeah. We work on all seven categories simultaneously. It's not a matter of focusing on one. That's old medicine model. Yeah. So, you know, people will say, well, fix my sleep. Well, are you eating right? How's your stress? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. what's your relationship like? Yeah. You know, we have to hit all these things because the answers aren't in these individual pieces. It's like people looking for that limitless pill. It doesn't exist and it's not going to exist. You've got to do other things simultaneously in order for that to occur. Yeah, I like how you're making that really clear. Um, 
you got to have a solid understanding of those seven major categories of wellness um, right. and pursue uh, uh, a conscientious pursuit with yourself, an honest goal setting and achievement with yourself in those, in those fields. Um, is there something else that we should mention, Dan, about Apiron or about um, what you're building that we missed that you think is really important? We are building an AI platform. Okay. Um, now, this is going to be a whole different approach based on, on our model, but uh, the AI platform is going to incorporate everybody's genetic data, their lab work, their supplements, their medications, their, um, their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And the really nice thing about it is we're going to incorporate our coaches to help make sure that this is maintained. Yeah and we're gonna incorporate biometric monitoring devices, but we're also gonna have subjective confirmation on these devices on this platform. And I know there's a lot of people out there developing platforms, but we have, we're leveraging our distribution network with the coaches to help make this work. You know, a lot of these companies are trying to get all these people in, and they, they're great for about a month, and then people drop off. They quit doing it. Uh, with the accountability of the coaches, we think we can develop a platform that will get real actionable data and we will start seeing interaction. So you have this, this gene, you took this supplement, this is the common outcome yes. we're seeing in this group of people. Yes. And it's all going to be kind of crowdsourced. So everybody uh, is going to voluntarily be on this platform that wants to be. So you choose to share your data on this platform in exchange for getting the benefits of being in that group. Yeah. Uh, we're not going to share the data. We're not going to sell the data. It's the same with our genetic testing. We don't do any of that. And finding the patterns, I love that. I'm really happy that you brought that up because when you find the patterns, it makes it so you don't have to do the trial and errors right. again and again. Yeah, yeah, you get it. And there's, there's going to be a lot of variables to, to crunch. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's going to take a quantum computer at some point to, to crunch, and, and it's because the human system is unpredictable. Mm -hmm. It is a highly variable system, and, and you hit the nail on the head there. I mean, that's the problem with the current system, is it's based on that assumption of an algorithm works, and yeah. that would assume that we were computers and robots. Yeah, and like you said, it's a specific you know, maybe a specific supplement for a specific ailment, uh, for a specific gene to change, you know, or a specific exercise routine for a specific, you know, demographic of people or that have a certain ailment, you know, there's, yeah, it's just, yeah, this is, it's very tough to figure it out. But once we get the, the kind of this, this fundamental layer of, of principles and research that at least we can build on top, we need to build at least that layer and keep building the layers on top. And if new advancements come, then we can go it has back. Has to be dynamic. Yes, yes. I mean, research alone is broken right now because it's based on uh, a non-uniform population, but it makes the assumption that the population is uniform. Yeah. And that's where it's not working. And this is where it has to come down to this dynamic. This has been super interesting, Dan. I'm really happy that you're building this into our world. Yes. And this is, I, I, I personally, I need to learn more about epigenetics. I need to learn more about how we behave in our in our environments in these seven categories that you listed, and really dive deep into into. I always I always say like when I ask people questions, I'm like, look in the mirror and ask yourself these questions too. And so you know, how often am I? You know, the quantified self movement will help us a lot um, if we actually take that onto ourselves and be like, you know, I can't lie because my my, my data, data is clear, is clear <laughs> that I wasn't sleeping or exercising. My heart rate's been the same all day, you know, or yeah. Um, awesome. So that was a lot of fun. Thank it you was. for teaching us. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on to the show. Thanks for having me. That was a lot of fun. And uh, everyone, um, go check out the link in the bio to appear on. Please go check them out. Also, um, check out Transformative Technology Conference, link in the bio as well in their academy. Um, 
Also, go and leave us some comments. We'd love to hear from you about what you know about epigenetics, about what you know about changing your behaviors and your environments and how that affects you. We'd love to, you know, like we said, start the conversation and keep up building onto that foundation of knowledge that we're pursuing. Also, go and build the future. Go manifest your dreams into the world. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. We appreciate it. And we'll see you soon. Peace. Thank you so much. That was fun. I'm glad you had a good time. Yeah.